Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us here today. My name is Susan Bontoon. I'm the Science Communication and Content Manager at Ambari, and I'll be moderating this panel with my colleague, Kali Weiner, from, who is the Director of Communications at Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge all our panelists for the global perspective they bring and the wisdom they will be sharing with us that has been informed by a long history of learning by many generations prior. Mbari and Schmidt Ocean Institute are excited to host what we hope will be an inspiring and pragmatic conversation about how to make ocean science, engineering, and exploration more accessible and inclusive for all people. The world ocean ties us all together and we hope that we will collectively gain insight into how this global context can inform science communication practices. We've gathered together a group of speakers, researchers, advocates, educators, and science communicators who represent a variety of ocean communities and lived experiences. Here at the start of the UN decade for Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development, we're grappling with unprecedented threats to the ocean for, from climate change, pollution, overfishing, and the looming push toward deep sea mining. It is more important than ever that we make sure everyone has a voice um, in ocean science and policy making. As we communicate our work, we must speak to a global community and, and their values, not just in terms of economic motivations, but in terms of their moral values. The health of the ocean touches everyone on the planet and it's time for us to include and create accessibility for all ranges of abilities, racial and economic backgrounds, gender identities, geographic locations, and indigenous voices. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Carly. Thanks, Susan. We are really excited to bring everyone here today together to see what interesting new ideas and perspectives arise from this discussion, and I promise it's going to be a good one. We often talk about the ocean in terms of being inaccessible, and there are significant challenges for getting there and collecting data. This applies to science communications as well. For many people, the ocean is distant and far uh, and unfamiliar, but especially the open and deep ocean. We recognize that we could be doing a better job of inviting more people into this conversation and fostering a diverse community to make ocean science communication more inclusive and accessible. Today, we are gonna to cover a range of topics within ocean sciences from naming species to seabed mining to making ship-based work more inclusive for working parents. We promise we won't leave any topic unturned each panelist will speak for about five minutes and then we will have 50 minutes for open discussion. We are not gonna split into breakout groups today in the interest of time. Um, we'll let each, each panelist introduce themselves, but we again invite you to please type your questions into the chat. We'll be monitoring it there and we will incorporate uh, your questions into the discussion. We will also share shortly a Google Doc link where everyone can share ideas for best practices and any other thoughts that you might have. Um, you may see us give a one minute warning to our speakers and that's just to keep our conversation flowing and on time. So with that, logistics are out of the way, let's get into the conversation. I'd like to first start by handing it over to um, our initial speaker, Corey Garza, to start us off. Hey, thanks for your introduction, Corey. So I'm Corey Garza, a professor in the Department of Marine Science at Cal State Monterey Bay. And so I'll go ahead and kick us off with kind of a general overview of, of what, why we're here. So I'm just gonna set the, the, the picture here for everyone right now. And so this is uh, diversity data for the ocean sciences. And we're getting to the issue of inclusion here. And this is one of the more recent uh, statistical uh, surveys from uh, the National Science Foundation where they surveyed students who are graduate students in the ocean sciences, but who also identify as being underrepresented. So this would be individuals who are black, Hispanic, a Native American, a Pacific Islander, Native Alaskan. And about 13% of those surveyed were identified as being a part of one of those groups. 
Now, if you look at something like the biological sciences, they have about 18% underrepresented. So you might think, well, that's not a big deal. It's when you look at the whole number comparison where you see sort of the disparity in the numbers. Um, that 13% of students actually translated to 379 students compared to about 9,500 uh, in the biological sciences. And so what it's showing you is that students who come from these groups just aren't being, they're not attracted to this discipline for one reason or another. And this paper came out a, a few years ago. This is Bernard and, and Cooper Doc paper. And it talked about no progress on diversity 40 years in the geosciences, which is the broader discipline right, that the ocean sciences fall under here. And you can take a total look, you know, the number of PhDs over time and here are the ocean sciences in blue. And they broke it down by race, race and ethnicity. And so the black line here are students who come from majority groups, they identify as white or Caucasian. Okay, so these lines here you can barely see because these are the students who identify as coming from one of these underrepresented groups, Native American, Asian, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic or Latino, or their, their identity was unknown. <clears throat> if you actually dig into it and you start to look at the groups, you actually see how few PhDs are actually being earned by, by different groups in, in these uh, different disciplines. For example, here, the blue line that I highlight are Hispanic. And the reason I've got this circle here, that little dip there, I'm one of those points there, one of those five PhDs, one of those five Hispanics who actually got a PhD, right, in 2001. And so it's showing sort of, we've got a lot of sort of challenges here in terms of attracting diverse student populations, right, to the geosciences as a whole, you know, let alone the ocean sciences. So some of the things I've worked on over the, the last few years here is like, why are we seeing some of these things? Now, we know that there's institutional barriers there's financial barriers, but there's other barriers as well, and things that we don't sometimes think about, right, as being barriers. You know, one, we talked a little bit about this, the lack of the personal connection, right, to issues around the ocean. You know, I grew up in LA, I grew up in East LA, and so when people hear I grew up in LA, what pops up is always kind of the, whatever they show on the Oscar telecast, like the people rollerblading on Venice Beach. Okay, LA is actually nowhere near the ocean. It's like a good 40 minutes from that scene, so I actually grew up, like, strongly disconnected right from the ocean. So I really didn't get to experience the ocean. Maybe once a summer we go to the beach. And so there's this assumption that, you know, if you're somewhere near the water, you have a connection, but we just didn't have a connection. We didn't have a car <laughs> to get out to the beach. And so that was a big barrier. Sometimes there's an unclear understanding by students. You know, I, when I got my PhD, you know, my family thought I was going to go work with Jacques Cousteau or SeaWorld, right, what you actually do, right? And so we kind of don't do the best job about talking about what we actually do in the ocean sciences. And in part, it has to do with the messaging that we use in terms of messaging and the engagement that we have, especially when students are really early on right, in their careers. Right? Um, if you ask a room of like 30 ocean scientists what, you, what they do, you're likely to get 30 different answers right, in this case. Whereas if you talk to folks in the biomedical uh, research fields, they usually have a really good coordinated, concise answer in terms of what they do. Even some of the imagery that we use is actually a barrier in and of itself. So here's kind of a couple of pictures I put with an example. So on the left, that's your classic, you know, graduate school and oceanography program brochure, a bunch of people hauling heavy gear around. It looks really dramatic. On the right, I Googled construction jobs, and that's what came up, which you're looking on the right. These are pretty much mirror images of each other. So if you're trying to recruit a student who maybe comes from a blue collar background, construction, they don't want to do that anymore. Those two jobs don't look that different from each other. What you're telling the student from that community is that this is going to be heavy manual labor, right? You're also sending other messages without even knowing it. Uh, if you're physically disabled, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, you have to be a guy <laughs> looking at that picture, right? If you're not white, you might be out of luck as well. And so before you've even engaged with these student populations, you've already lost them just based on some of the imagery that, that you're using in here. And then the other challenge we run into is just the historic overemphasis of certain fields. And I talk about this with the biomedical sciences because they tend to have really clear um, career options at the end rather than the ocean scientists. In ocean sciences, we tend to be a little more sort of wishy-washy, a little squishy about what it is you're going to do right at, at the end. So I think, you know, we really do have really great opportunities for improving, you know, diversity in ocean sciences, you know, about messaging and student engagement, thinking about the career options and the leadership development as well, like how, who's actually doing this. So just in closing, like why do we want to diversify STEM as a whole? Well, one, clearly it improves the diversity of who engages the STEM. It helps you bring new ideas and perspectives to our field, right? Beyond just bringing people who look different, you're also bringing the perspective in your field. And when you do that, it can result in a new way of conducting science. And so part of getting all these folks in, it's really changing how we communicate what is it that we do to the student and groups that we want to connect with. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Joydika Birmani uh, from the Schmidt Ocean Institute.
Thank you, Corey. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this incredible and really interesting panel on a topic that's something that we're clearly all looking at with great scrutiny. So uh, as Corey said, I'm Jotika Vamani. I'm the executive director for the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And the Schmidt Ocean Institute was established in 2009 by Eric and Wendy Schmidt to advance the frontiers of ocean exploration and research through technological advancement, intelligent observation, and the open sharing of information. We operate a research vessel, Falcor, which is named after the luck dragon in never ending story. Um, the Falcor is actually currently in Mexico, uh, exploring hydrothermal uh, vent field off in the Pescadero Basin. And we have a new vessel, Falcor 2, that is in Spain undergoing a refit, and that will become operational next summer. So recognizing that uh, the expense of going to sea has been a barrier for scientists and marine technology developers, we offer all of this, uh, the research vessel, the labs, the science equipment, uh, robotic tools, our high performance computing facility at no cost to scientists from around the world to collaborate and conduct cutting edge science and technology development. And in exchange, we ask that they make that uh, their, pub their findings public uh, and their data available uh, quickly uh, in an open manner because the open sharing of data, the faster it's available, the faster our collective understanding increases and the faster we can respond to things that are changing. So in addition to Falcor, we have a sophisticated robot, the ROV Sebastian, which is a remotely operated vehicle. It can go down to 4,500 meter depth and it's equipped with a 4K camera and camera system actually and plethora of sampling capabilities. And we also have an advanced communication system on board that allows us to conduct telepresence cruises. And that's really helped us to continue operations throughout the pandemic with scientists tuning in remotely from their living rooms as we broadcast live. And that brings me to the topic of this discussion. How do we make the ocean more accessible and the access more equitable? So last year at Schmidt Ocean Institute, we looked at the statistics of those who sailed on our vessels and we found that we were lacking in a few ways. Uh, and through that, we started to develop an inclusivity, diversity, equity and accessibility plan idea for short, uh, which was work that was led actually at SOI by Leonard Pace and Carly, who's moderating this panel. Um, <clears throat> the goal was to identify actionable items that we can execute on within the framework of SOI's operations to give more people an opportunity to participate in these cruises and to expand the marine science pipeline internationally. Um, so clearly using technology is one mechanism and the ability for telepresence cruises and live streaming the dives increases everyone's accessibility to the ocean. But taking that a step further, we've started to implement augmented reality, which will really allow for an increased interaction and we hope will eventually allow for greater participation from scientists who are not able to go to sea, whether that's because of a physical disability, which Corey, I, uh, you also mentioned briefly uh, about physical disabilities, or because of familial obligations. But we also looked at other ways. And this year, I'm excited to let you all know that we launched a program to support the costs for those who sail, or some costs for those who sail on board who have dependents. So uh, scientists with children or elderly or other dependents. Uh, and this was implemented because we heard from the scientific community that some can't go to sea, can't go out in the field because of these responsibilities. And so this year we did a soft launch of this and it's open to anyone in the science party who sails, students, postdocs, scientists, and we'll formally roll it out next year along with Falcor 2 once it's operational. But we have offered this now to three, um, to participants on three expeditions. We also look at inclusivity in other ways though. Our Artist at Sea program is a great example of that. Uh, and this is something that's been going on for a few years now at SOI. And in this program, we bring aboard artists to sail with the scientists to learn and to interpret the work in their own unique ways. Bringing the ocean sciences to new audiences through the eyes of artists really brings in a public audience that may not watch our live streams or read about scientific discoveries. So those are just a few examples of, you know, some of the actions that we're taking uh, to increase accessibility in marine science. And 
I'm really looking forward to the rest of this conversation, but I think I will hand over to uh, the next speaker, uh, George Matsumoto from Ambari. Thank you very much, Joydika. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to participate in the panel today. Uh, my name is George Matsumoto. I'm uh, salt and pepper hair, Asian American, Japanese, and I'm talking, uh, I'm, I'm showing a slide right now of Embari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute with a couple of humpback whales feeding in front of the institution. And this is actually a real picture. It's not a, it's not a, a managed or, a uh, produced piece. This is how close the whales sometimes get to us. Uh, what I would like to do today in the next few minutes is present three recent efforts that Ambari has been involved with uh, in order to try to increase our reach and breadth of audience, try to increase access to STEM information, um, and really try to make the ocean a little bit more accessible uh, to the general public. We realize that we have a long way to go and we're looking forward to discussions around these efforts to try to help us to do better. Uh, the three aspects I'd like to focus on today are a live stream or broadcast that we produced this year, an Adopt-A-Float program that we've been running for a couple of years and will be continuing to run into the future, and then sort of a basic effort to try to build empathy as a form of inclusive science communication. So in 2021, Ambari broadcast a very produced live stream incorporating canned video, presenters on land, presenters at sea, and live remotely operated vehicle from almost 2,000 meters down. In fact, one of the participants uh, in the section today, Hannah McDonald, uh, you could see pictured in the upper right-hand slide, uh, she was our primary presenter as she coordinated and anchored the entire broadcast. Um, we contracted with American Sign Language interpreters as we are based in the United States. So we used American Sign Language. We do recognize that there are many different types of sign language, many different languages, but we focused on American Sign Language. And we also integrated Wordly as this particular symposium is doing as well in the hopes that we would be able to attract viewers from around the world. Our audience, our hopeful, our hope for audience were people outside the ocean science community uh, students interested in exploring an ocean career. So we weren't trying to focus on people who are already heavily involved in ocean exploration, as uh, Joydika was just talking about with her telepresence, because she does get a huge dedicated fan base that really knows a lot about the deep ocean. Our communication goals were try to focus on inclusivity, uh, try to talk a little bit about an upcoming exhibit uh, exhibition by the Monterey Bay Aquarium on the deep sea, and really think about teamwork, conservation, climate change, deep sea corals, and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and wrap all that into a produced 55-minute uh, piece. We're able to reach about 25,000 people with this one-hour production, which was very encouraging, and we plan on continuing this into 2022. We also run a program where we launch, build, launch, and deploy uh, these profiling floats, these biogeochemical profiling floats that profile the water column from 2,000 meters to the surface every 10 days, and they'll do this for about five years. Uh, we run an outreach program called Adopt-A-Float, uh, where classrooms or students or after-school groups or pretty much any type of group you could think of can adopt a float. There is no charge to adopt the float. And what we're hoping to do is really try to get real oceanographic data into the classrooms and try to increase access to this data and educational content to a more diverse community of educators and students. Uh, these biogeochemical floats were uh, developed and supported by two national science funded projects, SOCOM uh, and GOBGC. Um, and all the data is posted online along with lesson plans to try to help educators bring this data into the classrooms. In the slide I have pictured here, you could see on the far left, uh, what the weather might look like and some of the reasons why uh, using remote data can be a good thing because not everybody can go to sea and maybe not everybody wants to go to sea. The sea is actually in a uh, somewhat hostile environment. These profiling floats give us an opportunity to explore the ocean 24 hours a day, 365 days a year and all around the global ocean. Seaside Middle School, which is pictured on the far right as a local school to us in Monterey, and it is a school with uh, probably close to, it's over 70% uh, 
Hispanic. Uh, so it really does reflect the type of community that we're hoping to reach with this adopt a float program. Um, with over 130 floats adopted per year, we have lots of opportunities for adopters. Integrity that you could see on the lower left was one of the first floats adopted and launched during the COVID uh, pandemic um, as part of the Global Ocean Biogeochemical uh, Program, a new NSF funded program to build and deploy 500 floats globally over the next five years. To date, the adopt a float program has reached 35 states and over five different countries, and we've adopted, uh, we've gotten adopted over 200 floats thus far. Building empathy frameworks can be a very inclusive pathway for trying to connect an audience to act for the ocean. We really want to try to build empathy for the life within the ocean, in particular with regard to the deep sea, which is often more unfamiliar to the public. Ambaria is focused on sharing imagery, video, and stories on social media, on our website, and uh, a number of high-profile media platforms to try to help people get to know these incredible creatures and in the process, perhaps emphasize with them. And finally, I'd like to discuss this concept that has been used recently, uh, not very, has been used quite a bit, and that's a parachute science where researchers may engage in research without the involvement and communication with local communities. Nambari has been involved in the naming process, naming underwater locations and unknown to science species in the past. And what I'd like to do is end with an example of this and a comment that we know now, thanks to Max's keynote yesterday, is that we should perhaps think about using community review as well as scientific review when we're involved in the process of research and naming. So where the Schmidt uh, Ocean vessel, uh, the Falcor is right now, is down in the Pescadero Basin, which you can see on the left-hand side of this new slide. Uh, Los Cabos in the Baja California Peninsula is pictured on the far left. The NPB is the Northern Pescadero Basin. SPB is the Southern Pescadero Basin. And in, 20, um, in 2015 and 2018, two hydrothermal vent fields were visited, identified, and named by researchers on board the Falcor and on board the re research vessel, the Western Flyer, that Ambari owns and operates. Um, Ambari has been involved in several expeditions into the Gulf of California over the past 20 years. And Mexico requires that we include local researchers in every leg of the expedition. And the researchers on the 2018 um, Ambari expedition and the 2015 Falcor expedition named these two vent fields, the Alca vent field uh, identified in 2015 and the Yaikima field identified in 2018. Uh, the language was from the Kiliwa ethnic group, uh, which is one of the tribes, ethnic groups that are indigenous to the adjacent landmass and still continue to live in Northern California right now. Uh, the formal names were derived from the Yuman dialect a collection of ancient indigenous tribes that inhabited the Baja Peninsula and the coasts of Sonora. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Diva Aman to tell you a little bit about some of the work that she has been involved in. Thank you, George. Um, so I'm a marine biologist from Trinidad and Tobago, and I focus on the little known habitats and animals of the deep ocean and how our actions are impacting them. I tend to sit in this weird place where I'm at this nexus of science and policy and communication, and I have a really deep desire to see stewardship measures applied to more of the ocean, especially the deep ocean, as well as the engagement of a broader group of stakeholders towards that effort. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how accessibility and inclusion in the communication of ocean exploration really relates to the ocean issues of today. And ultimately, I think that majorly comes down to narratives, you know, who is telling this story. And, you know, given the huge amount of resources needed to conduct ocean exploration and research, that story tends to near solely be told by a very restricted demographic, predominantly white male scientists from developed nations. And this limited narrative hasn't historically engaged with as broad a section of humankind as it could have. And we're now seeing, you know, to complicate things further, this rise of the blue economy. This is meant to be the big solution to all of our problems. 
Um, but actually, it's just going to be a rise in ocean use and ocean exploitation. And so when we're thinking about the blue economy, the ocean is split into two main forms of governance within countries' borders. So, you know, within national jurisdictions and then beyond national jurisdictions. So in international waters. And so I'd like to give two examples to demonstrate the problems of this limited narratives in each of these forms of governance. So in ocean exploration and research, there's, as we heard from George, there's quite a lot of parachute science. And as we're seeing this you know, um, rise in countries wanting to reap the benefits of the blue economy, as much scientific knowledge as possible is needed to inform and manage those potential activities. And yet often we have research being undertaken in a country's waters where they themselves don't have the capacity and research, this research is often really specific and not necessarily a priority of the country or what would be helpful to the country in the long term. And worse yet, often the citizens of the country don't even know it's happening. And so there can be this entire communication campaign built around like live streams, as we heard from Jodica, and the incredible outreach events planned with schools and communities, but often those are primarily in the US or the UK. And there isn't much that, some that focuses on the country where the research itself is happening. And I think there's, you know, that that's of course deeply problematic, but there's nothing that brings that, that knowledge and that cultural heritage to those who it ultimately belongs to. And another symptom of parachute science, which we already have heard from George and yesterday, Max, is this issue of naming. Um, I can't, as, as you've heard, I come from the Caribbean. And that is a region where, you know, a litany of places are named after far away pieces of Europe. And with this new tide of ocean exploration by this handful of developed nations where, you know, multiple names, I mean, on every single research cruise, there are name, there's naming happening. Is this not and I'm being you know, deliberately provocative here, but is this not colonization all over again, just in a different space? And it's not just the naming of places to consider, but what about species as well? And I hope that's something we can touch on in the discussion. And if we move even further from shore out into those international waters, we really find ourselves in an even more curious situation where we're in an ocean that is governed by no one country. And, there is unfortunately this frontier mentality that dominates, you know, ultimately explore, and then once you've explored, ultimately exploit, including, as we heard from um, Susan at the beginning of the session, this potential for a new and hugely destructive industry called deep seabed mining. And what is astounding to me is that the mineral resources in international waters are known as the common heritage of mankind, an exclusionary term, we can touch on that later, but which means that ultimately those resources belong to me, they belong to you, they belong to everyone in this conference, they belong to everyone in the world, and even generations that are yet to come. And not only is this exploitation, potential exploitation, once again being going to be done by a handful of nations and people, but the majority of humankind hasn't been engaged in the negotiations about where the deep seabed mining should happen. And in fact, most of humankind isn't even aware that this is potentially coming. And it's the same as climate change, unfortunately. The most marginalized communities will be those that are most significantly affected by the impacts of this industry. And yet they do not have a seat at the table, yet they are not part of the discussions. And so I, knowing and understanding, I think, is the first step towards caring. And given that our ocean is already changing rapidly, even those places far out of our sight, it's imperative that we not only involve as much of humankind in ocean exploration and decision making, but also shape our scientific research and communication around the people who are most ocean dependent. Um, I think we need to be investing in all of humankind, you know, from underrepresented nations to indigenous people and local communities, because ultimately when it comes to the ocean, we all have a stake in it. So I'm really looking forward to participating in the discussion later on and especially hearing from the others, um, including the next speaker, Chloe Brown, about ways in which we can work together to find solutions. And many thanks for your attention. 
Thank you, Diva, for that great introduction and such a, wow, just such a thought-provoking topic as well. In my experience, I've worked largely with the Latinx community, especially within the context of my home state of California and as well as the United States as a whole. But I wanna take a moment and take a step back and really acknowledge why we're here today. It's our love of the ocean. And for me, the ocean is truly my home. It makes me think of this quote by Dr. Sylvia Earle that every time I slip into the ocean, it's like going home. And as I can imagine, as many members of this panel have had the experience of entering into hopefully some warm, not always frigid waters like off the coast of the Monterey Bay, it's just such a welcoming sensation. And I really strive to have that same kind of welcoming sense for my own community as well. So I hope to go ahead and explore that, how we can be engaging, inclusive, and generate the sense of belonging within this community. Um, as a little bit of background for myself, I self-identify as being Latina. Um, my family is from El Salvador, and I'm a second generation American, so I was born and raised in the United States. Throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the term Latinx to describe the group that is typically known as being Latino or Hispanic. Within that, there is some limitations of how this language has been used, and I'd be more than welcome to go ahead and discuss that in our later discussion point, but please feel free to drop any questions about that. One of the main things I do want to acknowledge within this is that the Latinx community, both within the U.S. and around the world, is that we're not a monolith. We're a beautiful blend of races, cultures, languages, and other identities that just come together that share, often share many common values that I'll touch upon. My work in ocean advocacy, as I mentioned before, has mainly been on a statewide scale. As such, I'm most familiar with the demographics of the US community and how we can come together to be a force united in ocean conservation action. And in such, I want to go ahead and acknowledge that in developing communication, it's really critical to understand how monolingual communications can alienate the same communities we aim to serve. As Latin America covers a large geographic region, it, there are a variety of languages spoken by Latinxes, from English, Spanish, to indigenous languages such as Mistec and Mayan. There are many ways that we can go ahead and reach out and engage with this community. As such, in the US, 41% of Latinos aged 18 to 35 are English dominant, 40% are bilingual, and 19% are Spanish dominant. So you can interpret this in a number of ways. On one hand, if you were to generate content in English, 81% of Latinxes would interact with it. Content in Spanish, 59% of Latinxes would interact with it. However, messaging exclusively in these languages can alienate 19% in English and 41% in Spanish. So by combining languages as we can do with a plethora of technologies available to us, we can reach a broader scale as well. And I think one of the most incredible ways that language has shaped how people interact with the world is how it can impact our thoughts about climate change. The Yale Program for Climate Change Communication um, as you may all know, the one that published the report of Climate Change's Six Americas published a follow-up study, because we all love those follow-up studies, on climate change in the Latino mind. Within that, they went ahead and found that Latinos are more engaged than non-Latinos on the issue of climate change. And within that, the most surprising, or maybe not even surprising, was that eight out of 10 Latinos surveyed and nine out of 10 Spanish language also known as those who have a preference for Spanish, found that global, were believe that global warming is happening compared to seven out of 10 non-Latinos. It's really important to acknowledge that there is a strong environmental ethic that is embedded in our core that hasn't always been represented in the world and in the spaces that we hope to engage in conservation. And within that, that's often due to institutionalized barriers. There is an interest in engaging in this ocean conservation policy action, but as for this unique community, there are barriers such as not having the language available to them or simply not being contacted or not knowing where to go. 73% of Latinos felt in this study that no one had ever asked them to contact their elected officials. And beyond that, majorities of both Latinos and non-Latinos didn't even know who to contact as well, really highlighting the need for concrete outreach to these groups as well. 
Another key point is that many Latinos do not identify as activists. And within that, we really need to expand our representation and ensure that we are both amplifying and uplifting voices that have often been pushed to the margins. So um, a great way that we can go ahead and do that is by engaging with very great uh, messaging strategies, such as those found in Heartwired to Love the Ocean, an incredible report if you have not explored it already that was published with the Lucille Packard Foundation and many of the colleagues at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Within that, some of the key messaging frameworks that were found to really perform well with the Latinx community were those that really involved family, intergenerational storytelling, as well as God's beautiful creation, as these are strong values that can run across and connect us all. As such, and this is a great opportunity for us to go ahead and discuss what brings us together in loving the ocean. And I look forward to hearing from all of you in our discussion. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Charles as you can go ahead and hear some more perspectives on this as well. Thank you. Um, I guess it's to me. Uh, Aloha, thank you from Hawaii. Uh, my name is Charles Kai, and I'd like to thank Ambari and the symposium for inviting me to participate in this panel. I hope I have something that I can contribute. I retired from the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. And the council is one of eight regional fishery management councils created by the Magnuson Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976. In 1996, the act was amended to include programs for communities and native people to participate in the council management process. Uh, the amendments moved federal fishery management from species-based management to ecosystem-based management. And that required including people, that required uh, including the community in the management of these, um, of, of these fisheries. As a community and indigenous program coordinator, my job was to provide communities and native people access to the council process. And so that gave me an opportunity to travel all over uh, the Western Pacific region that the council was uh, authority to, in, was the authority for, for the US. And that was American Samoa, Guam, Northern Marianas and Hawaii. There was a lot of education for us uh, between, I'm native Hawaiian, between us and the council and between me and, and all of the other native groups that were in this area of responsibility. So there was a lot of education going back and forth. We had to learn about each other. We had to find some way to include these native people into the management process, which is still ongoing. It, it continues to go on even after I've retired. So a little bit of history, populating the Pacific Islands began about 25,000 years ago during the last ice age. The diaspora came in successive waves from Asia and Southeast Asia with the last pulse ending in um, Rapa Nui and Tuamoto about 600 AD. There were three language groups that came across the Pacific, Micronesian, Melanesian, and Polynesian. These are people with a long history and an intimate relationship with the ocean and a well-developed oceanic culture. Um, in working with these indigenous communities, we were able to document some of, their some of their traditional practices. And this included traditional resource management practices and their preferred process of engaging and sharing information with guests that came into this, uh, to the group. And let me see if share screen works. Okay, apparently it doesn't. <laughs> okay, I'm not sharing screen, am I? No, we don't see your screen. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll talk through this. Um, let me try it again. No, okay. So I will talk through this. What, what we found out was that the traditional resource management process involved five, what we call pillars of management. Um, the five pillars were adaptive management, which was a regulatory process for these indigenous communities, a code of conduct so that the community would adopt 
a code of conduct that supported the regulatory process. It involved community consultation. There was continuous community consultation going back and forth between the managers and the people. It involved education because education was required both ways in learning about the resources, understanding the resource and uh, pro portraying those, those resources. And probably the most important uh, management element was eligibility criteria to participate in the management. And what that eligibility criteria was, was knowledge. It was expertise. So as an example, if you were, if the community decided that they needed to manage a kule, or which is a big ice cap, um, they decided they needed management because there was, there was, there was scarcity. They would go to the person with the most intimate knowledge of that resource. And that is probably the Atula, Akule fisherman. And he would participate in the management of that resource. Uh, the basic concept in traditional management is that you harvest the abundance, but you conserve the scarcity. And that's how the management was. In dealing with the communities, uh, they also came up with a method of sharing information. And this was as a result of scientists coming in, uh, as George said earlier, parachuting in, asking for the communities to participate in their, in their process, uh, giving them information, sharing their knowledge about the resource, about resources, about the ocean, and then going out and writing a paper on it. So the most important thing for the native community was that this was a sharing of information and that it should be reciprocal. So it requires that you, you work, you make an effort to understand the community and you make an effort to introduce yourself to the community. And the sharing is always reciprocal. One of the things that they asked for was a gift. You know, come in, give us a gift. And the gift need not be material. They wanted a story, a song, a chant, a prayer, something about yourself to be shared within the community. And then there was a no, they wanted a negotiation of what knowledge, you, what information you wanted and how it was going to be used. And they wanted a say in how it was going to be used. So that there was this reciprocal relationship going on. Uh, one of the things now is I've, I've retired. And by retiring after 20 years of dealing with these communities, I've left projects unfinished. And that is a burden to me because by retiring, by getting to the point where I was unable to keep up with the process and the, and the speed of which information was being passed, I needed to pass it on. But I left projects undone. And I left many friends in the islands that I worked with for years and years on different projects uh, to provide solutions for different problems, uh, to address traditional uses of the ocean. And I kind of left them in a lurch, kind of though, but I was able to finish a number of projects on community-based management, ecosystem understanding, education, relationship with the communities, and cutting out a space within the management process for native communities to participate. And with that point, I don't know who is coming up next. I've lost. <laughs> That's okay, Charles. I'll take it over from here. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists. It's been really refreshing to hear some of your diverse perspectives and give us some thought about how we better uh, brought in inclusion and thoughtful consideration of how we're operating in ocean sciences. Uh, I see a lot of synergies between all of your work and I'd like to dive right into the discussion portion um, of this session because I think there's some big topics here to work through that you've all brought up. So actually, uh, Charlie, let's go back to you first. Um, and I, I wanna ask you a specific question about colonial mindset. Um, you know, especially with your experience working in and around Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. Um, when it comes to ocean exploration, you know, this is just one aspect of decolonizing the field. 
What are some material ways that you feel that institutions and researchers can work maybe to better decolonize the ocean science space? Oh, oh that, that's a good question. Um, it's really difficult because I think that the science base is very Western. It is very colonizing. Um, there's a lot of information out there that native people would wanna share. Um, one example I can give is that Micronesian navigators. The Micronesian navigators are really the resource managers of their islands. And the Micronesian islands have maintained their navigation through four schools called Po. And the reason they maintain that is because their atolls are so small that if they began to exploit the fisher, the resources and the food sources, I'm sorry, the food sources on their islands, they quickly fish them out. So the navigators have in their head a map of all of the uninhabited islands around their area. And they will sail and get food and bring it back. This entails a very narrow window of time because there is no ice. So you go there, you catch fish, you salt it, you keep it fresh, you bring it back. So they maintain their navigational skills. When, the, when I finally got them and they do not wanna participate because they have their skills, they have their knowledge, they know what they're gonna do. They do not wanna participate with the scientists. But when I brought them to participate with the scientists about turtle science, they were ignored. And Micronesian navigators see the ocean as just a bunch of trails. This is the trail we use to do this. This is the trail we use to do that. And they told the scientists that there are about between 50 and 80 trails of turtles swimming from the Northern Mariana Islands back to their natal islands. They come back and forth, they mate, they breed, they forage around the Northern Mariana Islands and they go back to their natal beaches and, and lay eggs. And they ignored it. 10 years later, Noah went in and started tracking these turtles. And they found that some of these turtles, they went south, east, west, north, and traveled for 2,000 miles with the satellite tracking, they were able to find that out. We could have started that 10 years ago, but we did start it. And so now we have a better understanding of the turtles around the Northern Mariana Islands, that they are not resident to those islands, that they travel there from their natal beaches to forage and breed, and then they go back to their natal beaches. So there's a lot of information there. I think what, what we wanna do is just open up our ears a little bit, uh, listen a little bit more to what's being said because they do have a long history. We do have a long history in the ocean. Thank you so much, Charles. Are there any other panelists that wanna comment on that? I wanted to jump in a little bit and yes, firstly thank Charles for um, I mean everything he said but particularly you know I, what I something I found so profound was his honesty and in and I think that's something that you know as a scientist as a as a, a scientist who has been privileged enough to engage in ocean exploration I think that's that's something that we sometimes lack is that ability to say hey we did make mistakes or hey we have had these shortcomings and I think that admission is like the first is basically one of the first steps to that improvement. And and I think just to echo what Charles has said, you know, that it, I think often, you know, science has it can be a elitist. And and he said it so perfectly. It's just about opening up our ears to different types of knowledge and knowledge from um, communities that haven't haven't necessarily been engaged with previously. Um, yeah. Totally agree. Great, okay. Well, I think we'll move on to another question. Um, and we wanna start this one off with, um, we wanna get into a few of our panelists have talked about this idea of the ocean being this final frontier and um, for human exploration and, what are some of the potential risks and limitations in using frontier or discovery framing in ocean communication? And what are some of the alternatives? So, um, Joydica, would you like to jump in on that? Yeah, sure, Susan. Thank you for uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
And actually, uh, it kind of ties in with what some of what Charles was saying. I mean, what I appreciated, uh, Divi, you hit on the honesty, what I appreciated was um, the uh, authentic actions that were taken, uh, you know, once the ears were opened. Uh, regarding frontier and discovery, and I don't know if this is going to be a popular viewpoint in this day and age, but... I like language that is inspirational. And yes, this is, you know, in, in a, a Western setting, though those are, you know, it's English language. There are uh, equally inspirational words in other languages as well. Um, and the idea of discovery, uh, the, it's one of the reasons why scientists enter the field of science is to discover, to find, mm -hmm. to be the first to see this or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the first to share this knowledge in the world we're not let's face it we don't enter science for the money okay we enter it for other reasons the inspiration the discovery the connection to the natural world at least for those of us in oceanography so I like the language uh, which is what I think you're um, asking here um, and it's not just ocean I mean space uh, there's land uh, frontiers and explorations if you go back historically um, even the Polynesians had a frontier that as they traveled across the Pacific. So to me, it's, it's woven in uh, to what we do and to that inspiration. And what I get a little concerned about is we focus on the language and not the meaning or the actions, which is what I really liked about what Charles, what you said, uh, is let's not get hung up on that language. Let's, let's listen. Um, they have that knowledge and then let's use that and take action. I come from, you know, my, my background is uh, Indian and I grew up with my dad giving me all this indigenous knowledge of what foods to eat and not to eat. And then like turmeric is, you know, oh, you should have this with this, this and this. And it's only recently in the Western world that turmeric has now become a superfood. So, um, so I don't know, to me that I like those, I like that. I like the idea of exploration. I like the idea of discovery. And I've, I'm concerned that we will lose the inspiration to the next generations by removing some of those, that oomph. As a follow on question, do you have um, any thoughts on how we can include international participation in discovery? Oh. Thank you for asking this, uh, and also thank you, Diva, for uh, for actually touching on on uh, one of the other things, which is uh, so one of the things that when we did our own statistical analysis of who sales uh, was the international participation. So this whole idea, you know, of parachute science, and we really want to make that action change. We want to take action to shift that. So one of the other things that we have implemented is uh, to wherever we are, so like we're in Mexico right now, is to provide funds and support for local institutions and schools to get the technology they need to be able to see the live stream dives of what is in their own waters and to encourage and inspire youngsters to really take an interest, whether, you know, Corey, you said you were, you know, miles from the ocean, even though you're in LA, it's true, there are so many who are very close to the ocean, but yet don't know what's out there. So, so that's another thing that we are doing. And um, we're about to roll out a new strategic framework, which really focuses on um, more international participation and providing this to scientists. And as George said, right now, we have uh, a large group of Mexican scientists on board Falcor uh, as we work with Embari on that project. Uh, so yes, there's many things that we can do, and it's certainly something we've identified, not just SOI, but international, you know, the global community, and there are certain actions that we can do to start changing this. And Diva, yeah, I was going to yeah, ask. Of course. <laughs> Um, I mean, honestly, all of the things that Schmidt is rolling out, I just think are so wonderful and so, um, you know, need, have been needed for so long. And it's so great to finally see them coming to fruition. Um, I, I just wanted to add that I think, like, yes, we're, we're getting to this great place where, um, you know, 
or not this great place, but I think we're getting to a place where we should be, right? Where scientists in nations where work is being done are invited, not just invited on board, but are, you know, co-designing that research. And, and I think we, we need to get, we, while these are great steps, I think we need to aspire to get to a place where the power dynamics have shifted completely. And it's not just about uh, local participation, but it's also about local, like basically locally led expeditions or, or research cruises or whatever term I know we were talking about before, but language you want to use. But is that though that those local scientists or those local communicators or whatever are front and center and are not just an accessory to um, research cruises. And I, and I know where it's probably going to be a while before we get there, but I think at least we have that like vision in mind, right? It, it may be a bit sooner because that's part of our strategic plan. So <laughs> thinking on the same wavelength. <laughs> Didn't mean to like steal any thunder there. <laughs> no worries. First. We're open to ideas though. I do want to throw that out to this uh, group. Uh, I just want to sort of uh, bring it back a little bit to what Carly asked in the beginning, which is this whole idea of exploration. I really like, I mean, I like the word exploration. I think we just have to be careful that it doesn't lead to uh, this idea of colonialism, of possession. Uh, I think it's okay to go explore. I think deciding that something belongs to us because we quote unquote found it is where we have to be careful. But the ocean really is unexplored. We don't know very much about it, but it's still not ours, except maybe it's ours to protect. Um, it's not ours to use. Charles, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Um, you know, it's, the ocean as a place to explore, I think uh, that is a good concept, but the ocean has been explored for a very long time and, and by people. And yeah, it's true. We don't have the access to the kind of deep undersea exploration that existed. But if, if you look at the stories and the chants that come out of native people, there is an understanding about the deep ocean and the origins and, and uh, the meanings. And there's a deep spirituality because if you did everything right 25,000 years ago, you still might not make it because you depended on the ocean for your, for your livelihood, for your living. So I think there's that kind of deep understanding and then a deep appreciation for it. And, um, You know, if if we fail at an exploration, we go home and start the experiment again. If native people in coming across the ocean failed at something, they starved. So there's a kind of a deeper, I don't know how to put it, a deeper appreciation and understanding of the ocean. And um, uh, it, I wish I knew a way to put it into words of, of how the native people and working with these different native people, Micronesians and Polynesians, American Samoans, um, uh, Maori, working with these different people and seeing that sameness of the spirituality and the sameness of understanding that goes throughout their cultures, I think was an important thing. Although exploration is good. And actually some of the things work, work where we did that we did in the communities captured the children, right? They got to be involved in uh, putting a, um, I know you call it a float, but we had, we, we had put out different scientific platforms for children to track in their classrooms if they had Wi-Fi. But we were able to do that in the classroom and, and that got their interest. So um, I think there's a lot to learn yet. Uh, from the native people and there's a lot to learn more in the future about what our resources are can i uh sorry can i just pick up on uh charles i think i absolutely agree with you i think um in my uh scientific slash western upbringing um 
the way I the the closest I can make a parallel to is there is data on lab reports stuck in offices in filing cabinets that we have not yet managed to digitize. So similarly, there is knowledge in people who have sailed the seas for thousands of years who whose knowledge we have not yet managed to weave in to the collective global knowledge. So that's how I kind of view it. It's the same. There's a program, Seabed 2030. There was a lot of data, of high resolution data that just hadn't been submitted to the global, you know, humanly accessible database, uh, which is starting to emerge now. So um, I can see, yeah, your point is really valid that there is a lot of knowledge, but I think there's also lots of the ocean that's still to be discovered as well. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a way of merging the two. I wanna take some of this conversation and um, bring it uh, to another important topic and really address some of these um, ideas that Charles and Jodica, you brought up around and George around knowledge. And there is a lot of knowledge embedded in language as well. And there's a lot of information that we get from language, whether it's place names or, you know, histories, how, how we talk about language. And, you know, I'll just throw it out there. There was a lot of debate amongst this uh, panel about land acknowledgements prior to um, our session today. We talked about whether we should do individual land acknowledgements since we're all in different locations um, or one general statement and why or why not we should have a land acknowledgement and looking at some of the debate around this um, because there does seem to be some diversion in um, the community about whether, you know, this is, culturally appropriate. Um, so I would like to throw that out to the group and maybe George, you could start this first um, in how we consider as a community, these types of acknowledgements and as ocean science people, do we have some sort of acknowledgement for the ocean itself, not just the land? So George, I'll start with you. Thanks Carly. And I, I, think, I think you really identified an issue that we need to work on. Um, I think we need an ocean acknowledgement. Uh, as you said, we many of us have land acknowledgements and, and we opted not to speak them today uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, University of Rhode Island is the organization running this particular workshop and they have an excellent uh, land acknowledgement statement that they do use. Um, but there are a lot of issues around land acknowledgement statements that have been coming uh, to the forefront recently. Uh, and as the keynote speaker yesterday, Max, pointed out, uh, it doesn't mean that we need to stop using them. It just becomes an uncomfortable discussion, which is a good thing. Uh, but it also points out the fact that we don't have an acknowledgement statement for the work we do on the ocean. And I think that would be an important thing to do because, as you said, most of the ocean belongs to everyone. Right. As Diva said, it's it's not it's not it doesn't belong to one gender. It, it doesn't it doesn't belong to one group. Uh, the, it's a global ocean. There's only one ocean. Anything we do in any part of it will eventually affect someone else somewhere in another area because the ocean, everything in the ocean is connected. So I would love if we could come up with a global ocean acknowledgement statement that we as ocean science communicators can start to use. anyone else on the panel have thoughts about an ocean acknowledgement? <laughs> you guys think it's a good idea or <laughs> maybe? Any suggestions? Okay, I, li I like the idea. I would actually ask those communities who have worked with the ocean for a long time if they already have one that we're not aware of. It's but I love, I love the idea, George. Yeah, it's an excellent idea. Yeah, and I think I think Susan pointed out uh, earlier in our discussions that there was recently a tweet uh, that went out on social media pointing out that 99% of the marine protected area coverage in the United States lies in waters that historically belonged to Samoans, Hawaiians, Chamorros, and other Micronesians. Uh, so, you know, but we don't really discuss that either, right? It's now a marine protected area. You know, protected from whom? Not not from them. They were doing a fine job protecting it. 
uh, before we got there. So it's it's I, th I think it's an issue that we we should think about discussing at some point. Well, I, I think you, you bring up a good point, George, that, that yes, all of our marine protected areas are in our Western Pacific region of influence of authority. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether you should or you shouldn't take that land acknowledgement out of the political realm, because a lot of the, the marine protected areas were political. I mean, it, it scored ecological points with whatever president put them in place. You know, uh, generally speaking, uh, these places uh, criminalize uh, native activities that went on in those areas and continue to go on. So by preserving, I don't know if that's the word, by making a monument out of, I don't know if that's the word, by locking this place up, we've criminalized people who have used it for hundreds of years. Uh, and it was a political process. Uh, I don't know if you can divorce the politics and uh, the social and society and the economy out of that process. And true enough, I work in a very political area, right? I mean, this was, the Western Pacific Council was about claiming 200 miles of ocean beyond these shores that we claim to have territory in. So that's what it was about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you can divorce the political from uh, maybe the reality, but, and I don't know if that's necessary. I, I don't know how you would proceed with that. Um, ocean recognition, all of the cultures, they can, I mean, we can really, if we wanted to do land recognition, we can go for days. We can go for days with our generations of history on it. Um, I know that in protocol, when I start talking about where I'm from and my generations and going to my great grandparents' generations, that can be an hour or two. And you don't know if you wanna spend that time on it unless it's that important to you and it's important to the discussion that's going on. It's a great point, Charles. Uh, I think we wanna dive a little deeper into this language, um, th these ideas about language. Susan, I know you had a question um, that you wanted to pose to the panel. Yeah, and I also just wanna point out one of the comments we got in the chat from um, Natalie and, um, they were talking about pursuing ocean knowledge through the lens of uh, relationship with it and obligation to it versus through ownership or firsting. And I think that is such a great point to, to uh, that really speaks to everything that we're um, discussing here that, because I don't even like the word belong, like the ocean doesn't belong to anybody, does it? <laughs> Um, and this idea of claiming it, I love, I just love the way that Natalie made this. Um, it's a relationship, right? And just like we have relationship to the planet um, and humans have made these, <laughs> these, you know, ways of owning things. But um, now let's shift to some of the things that we've been talking a lot about is in languaging and I also wanted to get a little more specific about language and like, how can we use language in an appropriate and sensitive manner when operating in science and in science communication? And um, I was wondering if Chloe might wanna hop in here because you did kind of mention a lot of languaging in your discussion. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Susan. Um, language definitely does play an important role. Um, specifically to my own community, there is a lot of controversy over the term that I prefer to use, Latinx. For that, there are colonial inputs to it as well. Though the term, many people do regard it as having arisen in the U.S. context because of younger U.S. generations, millennials, things of the sort, it actually did originate in Latin America abroad. 
there are really great questions that come up. Spanish is a very gendered language. And it's also too important to acknowledge that while Spanish is considered analogous and kind of the native language for a lot of Latin American countries, that's also a language of colonizers as well. The Spanish came to Latin America and spread the language there and many other indigenous languages died out there as well. So in that sense, there's many layers to it that I find quite interesting and would love to explore more. Um, going into that, thinking about how we can unite people with common terms as well. Something that in my work with policy in this recent realm that's a little bit outside of the ocean, but as always, because everything ties back to the ocean, this idea of chemical incineration or plastic incineration that's coming up in a comment period with the EPA. When we were proposing how to go about talking about this, we noticed that a lot of the framework was that citizens go ahead and provide commentary on this. For the Latinx community, citizenship, it can be a very tender issue to talk about. My mom didn't receive citizenship until she married my father. She did have documentation, which many folks do not have, but citizenship and using terms such as citizen, American, and things of the sort that are meant to unify folks can actually go ahead and separate them out as well. So just kind of thinking about terms that you can apply as a collective, residents, people who use a resource, just kind of thinking, thinking about how we can open up these terms and make them as inclusive as possible. And within that, really identifying our blind spots as well is a really important idea. And I'm happy to go ahead and open it up to anyone else that like to discuss language and their messaging practices too. Um, I was wondering if Corey had anything to add there. Oh, yeah, sure, I can I'd chime in. Yeah, I, mean, I know it goes with the Latinx one, because yeah, I mean, I think I'm part of that. I call myself the spanner generation. You know, I kind of span the sort of the younger and the older generation. And I know like the community I grew up in, East LA, like it's considered an outsider term, you know, because they more affiliate with Chicano because that was a political movement that that community, you know, so they kind of, if you, in fact, I went home for, for Christmas, I know my family was asking, what's this Latinx term? They never heard of it, right? Um, you and myself, I think like five years ago, I got introduced to the conference as a Latinx marine scientist. I didn't know what it meant, so I just kind of rolled with it. I figured it was like another term, you know, because I've been, um, you know, in my lifetime, I've been identified as Hispanic, Chicano, Latino, Mexican American, because our community is always trying to find an identity, right? The word to, and so I went and I thought it was actually a term for Latinos who grew up during Generation X, because that's kind of my generation. And so then I went and looked at it, and said, okay, well, here's what it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a gender neutral. Term, but yeah, it's one of those things where when you go into certain communities, especially you know Hispanic or Latin next communities in the U.S., they're, they're coming from different perspectives, right? As well, and so they have sort of different things. So you know, Cuban American community in Miami is going to be very different than a Mexican American community, you know, where I where I grew up in, and they, and they have sort of different emphases. So yeah, you have to kind of think carefully about the language you use, that because it's not going to be sort of one language, right? One terminology that you use, and so you, you have to be adaptable. Um, with that, like you, I'm on the DEI committee for the American Geophysical Union. You know, we have members in there who identify with the LGBTQ community, and even that community, they're having like arguments over how to identify, right, themselves. And you see a lot of that same split: the younger versus the older generation in that community. So I think it's not just you know within the Latin community that you're seeing this. You kind of see that as well. And so, yeah, I think you know one of the the lessons of that before you go into community. You don't want to assume that the language you're using is the language that that community uses. You can actually make things worse, right, when you go in. And I have seen that happen. And then, um, you know, to the other end, you know, just trying to engage communities outside of, you know, how they identify themselves. You know, just how do you, you speak to people? You know, because I have colleagues and who have a real hard time not talking like a scientist, right? And we'll go talk to, you know, deficient communities, and they've lost that community within the first few words. They'll use, you know, density-dependent feedback or... Sentinel species and people were like, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I had a colleague that did that with you know some local fishermen that I work with here. And like they they, they lost the fishermen within like the first few you know, minutes. Like, okay, well that conversation's done, um, right? And so also that you know how do you talk to people, right? And, and I and I had to do this growing up as well with my own family. I was the first person to go to college, and so how do I talk about what I'm doing to my family where you know we have no experience with this? And so you know I had that personal experience. With it, but that's the other component, you know, talk to people in a way where you can connect with them 
you know, and in some ways, uh, stuff that they value, right? What, what do they value? Like, what, what's the cultural landscape? What is the value hierarchy in their community? And how do you communicate around that as well? And that's another important part of that, that inclusive language. It's kind of kind of humbling yourself to some extent and putting yourself in other people's shoes and really understanding what are the things that they're going to connect with when you're trying to communicate with them. That's such a great point, Corey. And we actually got a question in the chat that I think really relates to what you're saying. Um, um, so we have Cynthia has um, a question about connecting the ocean acknowledgement with a lack of diversity in the field and wondering if digging deeper into cultural um, cultures that historically were more connected to the ocean, perhaps, but which now feel distant um, from the ocean and or because of the family cultural pressures choose to pursue fields like doctor, lawyer, or engineer, and how the ocean and geosciences community can help Latinx, Asian, and other cultures choose this field as a viable career path. It's um, so just like some thoughts on how you may, you know, how you think we can really invite these other cultures in on um, on the career paths. I know you you really mentioned that in your talk too. Yeah, I mean, a big part of it, it's one that we tend to overlook, it's in trying to you know, increase diversity in these types of fields. We only tend to focus on the students because that's what we're trained to do. It, we forget that there's actually a whole family support structure you know, behind those students that you have to engage with. You know, we, we do that with some of the programs I work with here, where I think um, years ago when I first started here, you know, some folks couldn't understand why the students who want to go to graduate school and say, well, it's probably because their families don't want them to go. And, they, and I, people couldn't like fathom that, that that was and you're like, well, yeah, because it's, you're trying to put them into a, a career field that's really unfamiliar to their family support structure. And in some families, there's an expectation, you know, that the younger generations become the providers, right, and to some extent. And, you know, going off, you know, going off to sea to explore doesn't kind of, kind of fit into that mold. And so, you know, part of it, it's not just connected with the students, but you actually have to have an active plan for engaging with the communities that those students come out, come out of, right, in this case. You know, like I talk about me growing up in LA, you know, bad air quality. Nobody said, go be an atmospheric scientist and deal with the issues of air quality. Let's go be a lawyer, go sue the company, go be a doctor, cure people, right? Go be a politician and change the rules. And it's just because as a discipline, we just don't have a presence, right, within that, that particular community. And so that's another part we have to think about, like, why aren't we in those communities? Why aren't we connecting? With them beyond just the students we hope to sort of take away from those communities which oftentimes that's how that's viewed i'd love to go back um oh jerica you go first there you um, actually you also back. chloe had unmuted herself so i don't know if chloe wanted to respond first and then yeah sure thank you um, for me, uh, being such an early career professional, I graduated during 2020. So just got back from my graduation actually in Boston this past weekend. So very interesting time indeed. And within that, I didn't see myself reflected in many of my professors. I was incredibly fortunate in my program to have conducted research on the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef one of my first true loves in the ocean. So it was incredible to be, go out there and see Latinxes or Latin Americans out in the field and see their connection with the ocean firsthand. But within that, as many of us have expressed, their knowledge wasn't necessarily respected. The places that our researchers knew to go to was because of our boat captains who had been going out there for years had noticed that, oh, this part of the reef is doing really well. If it's a lagoon area, or even just kind of rethinking um, entire ecological structures. I had the opportunity to, start to study coral reefs growing on mangrove roots, which completely flips on its head what we understand about mangroves. They're usually seen as being areas that don't do well for coral growth as they are um, typically a lot more nutrient dense, don't have great water clarity, but because of these historical observations, making sure that due credit is due. I did pick up on that a lot of times, seeing how um, professionals, my professors, as well as grad students did speak to people with these local knowledge as well. 
in all honesty, the place I felt safest and most supported was by going to the locals and helping them cook a meal, helping them do dishes, helping them do dinner. And part of me is really frustrated and outraged by that. Why don't I have a kinship with those in academia who I share more common traits with and I'm doing this experience with, but yet I still get pushed into these spaces. So really just kind of thinking about how we treat others as a whole really does echo in how we can encourage the next generation to go on and do that as well. So really thinking that there are ripples in this world. So seeing how we treat one another really does affect how we can be inclusive as well. Um, Jerica? Yeah, thank you, Chloe. Congratulations. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, I actually wanted to pick up, Corey, on something uh, that you were saying about it really is the family. And um, it, I was on another panel and uh, it was someone from NSF actually who pointed this out that um, for, to change the marine science pipeline as you get older and older, you have to start young. But kids don't necessarily go into sciences because they may be hungry, they may be working two jobs to help. So those who are not um, of privilege uh, have a whole host of other constraints on them, on their lifestyles. And so they are distracted or moved away from pursuing careers in science in general, let alone oceanography. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been starting to work with our uh, colleagues across the Schmidt Foundation and, uh, you know, the Schmidt entities to, our, our focus is undergraduate, graduate and above, but others have a focus for younger age groups to see what can we do. And I think that's a really important topic for everyone to look at is how can we change that situation for children um, in schools so that they have time to uh, focus on uh, perhaps more scientific or academic careers. So that's one piece. And then Chloe, uh, picking up on what you just said about, um, uh, you know, not seeing someone like yourself reflected, I think it's really important that there is diversity in, um, and I didn't actually realize this until about six years ago when someone came to me and said, wow, where I was growing up, there were no women scientists and I didn't even know this was an option for me. Um, and, I, and that really got me thinking that, you know, I've gone through like so much of my life and I never really thought about this. So I started to think back of, of where I got mine from. Like, and I grew up with Margaret Thatcher as prime minister, Indra Gandhi as, you know, uh, in India and my mum's got a PhD in chemistry and so it, it never even occurred to me, but I think that's an important thing that you've said. And um, uh, I've had a conversation since then uh, where someone said to me, uh, I won't say who it is, but someone said to me, I got asked to be on a panel and I think it's just because they are checking the boxes to have diversity. Uh, what I would say to that, and I encourage this for everyone is if that's what you think, you should still do it because people need to see you out there. And then you shine, you show them that, you know, you may have been brought in for whatever other reason, but you prove your worth because you all can. Uh, and, and you then become that example for everyone else. Anyway, that's all uh, uh, the points I wanted to make there. Thanks, Jodica. Um, there was also a really great point made by Cynthia in the comments about, you know, the PhD being intimidating or deal breaker. And oftentimes people thinking, you know, I have to have a PhD to, to go into ocean sciences and that requires a huge financial and time commitment. Um, does anybody have any comments on that uh, before we wrap up today? I'll chime in. I know that has been a big barrier. I mean, in fact, uh, one of the societies I belong to, uh, the Diversity and STEM Society, you know, they have been pushing, you know, students have to get a PhD. Like there, there was a certain model, like you have to be like the MD, PhD, Nobel laureate at Johns Hopkins, right? And that's a real intimidating thought, 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 for, thought for a student. Uh, but, you know, the idea is that many of the individuals I work with, you know, for them, a master's is a preferred terminal right degree because you know it aligns more with what their career interests are or things that they want to do and that's I think something we need to normalize a bit more so I, I do that quite a bit with you know individuals that I work with that 
yeah, PhD is one option, but you can do just as well with the master's. And there's, certain, there's a lot of career track. In fact, I used to be a postdoc at the EPA. My boss had a master's. Like she was the director of the Purdue division I was in. You know, that kind of threw people. I mean, my boss was in a PhD. I was like, well, that's pretty normal to have a, a master's a degree because it fits that particular job profile and that's enough. And so, yeah, I think we need to start to normalize that, you know, a bit more that the PhD isn't the end all be all, right, to be in the ocean sciences. It's been a really rich conversation today. There's been a lot to cover. We had more, uh, you know, topics as well. That um, being mindful that we only have a few minutes left. What I'd like to do actually is give each of our panelists one minute um, or less, one minute or less, to just quickly um, share anything that they felt like they didn't get to communicate today that they might want to share, or any final wrap up thoughts. Um, George, why don't we start with you? Thanks. Um, I guess I'll wrap up by saying uh, I know that I am going to make mistakes uh, and I am trying and I am learning. And I think that's going to be a continual process forever and probably for many of us. But I think the effort needs to be made. Well said. Diva? Oh, it's a bit hard to follow that, George. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I I just wanted to to leave us with the you know the fact that I think I think language does matter I think you know having obviously having more diversity inclusion and equity does matter and and, and ultimately you know really creating that um, that awareness and that understanding is really going to be hopefully one of the you know really open that gateway to really valuing our ocean because ultimately i mean without our ocean we are nothing um and it's just we just have to be better chloe i would say that as we've seen today you don't have to go it alone i know outreach can seem as a very scary thing working with these populations that maybe you don't have the most exposure to you aren't the most comfortable speaking with or you have no knowledge of that's okay. There's great opportunities for coalition building so that you can expand capacity together. None of us can do it all as we've seen over this past year. So I see a great opportunity for us to come together, partner with different institutions, whether they're museum institutions like aquariums, zoos, things of the like, after school programs, anything, just really going ahead and building that capacity together because we have this wonderful resource that is really worth protecting. Thank you. Charles. Oh, let's see. This is this is kind of difficult to wrap up. Um, I know I, I'd like to address that idea of, of how do you get people interested in, in, in ocean sciences. I was in discussion with a practitioner on Maui and he told me at one point, the way you understand more and the way you learn more about native practices is you adopt a practice. So that indicates that maybe an apprenticeship program, but he said that by adopting a practice like he adopted carving, it changes your muscles, it changes the way you think, it changes your view of the world. And so maybe that's what you have to do is get them introduced. Get well them said, Charles. In practice. Excellent. Thank you. Jerica. Um, gosh, I think everyone's made all the really, really great points. Um, uh, so I would add to that that um, I think we're in this amazing decade of ocean science ahead. I'm really, really happy to see that this conversation is taking place because uh, it does lead to change, recognizing uh, the issues first leads to change. Uh, and I think it can only benefit the ocean to have such amazing diversity of thoughts because the ocean is pretty diverse itself. All said, Jodica, and last but certainly not least, Corey, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, you know, be okay with being a little uncomfortable with this type of work because, you know, that, it's that discomfort where you start to learn things, right? And it's be okay with making mistakes as well because you're not going to learn anything unless you sort of put yourself out there. And it's when we start to, you know, navigate those uncomfortable spaces where we make mistakes that you really start to initiate change. Excellent. 
Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for such an interesting conversation, as well as to the audience. Um, you really uh, enhanced the conversation with your comments. Um, and thank you to Madison, who's been helping to tweet uh, out the conversation that we've had today, and to Heidi, who helped with the coordination in the background, and to um, my co-moderator, Susan. Thank you, everybody, for participating um, and joining us today.